a new way to optimize the customer experience, and it's sponsored by Kodak. I'm Pat McGrew, Director at InfoTrends, and I'm your host for today and your moderator for today. So we know that companies of all sizes know that they have to optimize their customers' experiences mm -hmm. to promote their brand. Today's event is about design thinking. It's not a new concept. It actually has its roots in the early 70s. But today, companies like Disney and Tesla and Uber and many others have made design thinking a key feature of their organizations. And they're recognized as providing superior customer experience disrupting current business models, and gaining a strong market position as a result of their use of design thinking ideas. It suggests that organizations that are infused by design-driven culture, they enable a lot of change. It, it enables a change that puts customers first. And to accomplish this, everything that a business does should place the end user or the customer first and foremost. So we hope you'll find this webinar extremely valuable. Now, before we get started, let me take a second and point out the tips for attendees widget on your console. It's the blue one with the wrench on it. If you missed the tech tips video we played leading up to the webinar, you can always click on that widget for more information. So with that, we're going to get started. So the first thing I'd like to do is introduce the, the men who are going to help us understand design thinking and its practical uses. Today's speakers will be Dave Hoffer, Director at McKinsey Digital, and David Finsky, who is the President of Finsky Media. The two together will bring us an amazing experience, which we hope you will find incredibly valuable. Our agenda for today is pretty straightforward. Today, we're going to help you understand how to integrate design thinking into your business processes and why you should consider doing it. So we'll talk fundamentals, we'll talk about the power of design thinking, and we'll talk about some strategies and tactics that you can use. The idea is to make it as, as practical and usable as possible so that you get some real takeaways. Now, here at InfoTrends, we do a fair amount of research into how customers behave and, and how investing in customer communications management actually empowers your business. Now, according to our information and our, our research, improving the customer experience is the top reason for investing in customer engagement technologies. And it's closely followed by increasing customer loyalty and a better understanding of the customer's emotional and practical purchase behaviors. We are just delighted that Dave Hoffer is with us because it's organizations like McKinsey and & Company and McKinsey Digital that have developed vibrant practices devoted to helping organizations expand just on those topics of customer engagement, customer experience, and customer loyalty, applying core design thinking principles to the business process. When you start to think about design thinking, there are five basic premises, five basic steps that are generally recognized in the design-driven process, where you empathize, you define, you, you basically try to ideate, you, you develop that, that whiteboarding and, and you think through all the processes. Then you prototype, you test, and you do it all again. It's a lather, rinse, repeat scenario, if you will. So that's the basic. That gets us started. But now comes the real meat. And the real, it is my absolute real pleasure to introduce to you Dave Hoffer, Director of McKinsey Digital, who's going to take us on the adventure through design thinking. So Dave, it's all yours. Hi, everyone. Uh, first, and let me say this, I think it's top of mind for everyone. Go Cubs. They did a great job. I'm not actually a Cubs fan, but I'm just excited for everyone in Chicago. They're having a great time. Uh, okay, so I'm uh, Dave Hoffer. I'm a director of, uh, of design over at McKinsey Digital. And I've been with McKinsey for approximately two years, but I've spent uh, a career of approximately 20 plus years, uh, primarily in Silicon Valley, um, as a designer. And uh, the design that I've done, you know, started off as, you know, website design back in the day, learning HTML and all that stuff, um, but grew uh, to include um, almost every screen you can think of. So I've designed for mobile, I've designed for desktop applications, uh, and then 
it, it became very clear that it, uh, you know design touched a lot of other touch points. And so designing for uh, numerous touch points within uh, a customer journey is, is, as my career has, has gone on. And now I'm with McKinsey. So let's talk today about uh, design, design thinking. The, the notion of design thinking, as Pat was talking about, has its roots early on. But what I like to do is I like to start uh, with a, just a, a basic story, okay? So the story that I like to tell is, is as follows. I've got a, a two little girls. I've got a four and a seven-year-old little girl. And Christmas, we decided to go to Disneyland. So I took them to Disneyland, which, by the way, Disneyland's great. Christmas is great. Don't put the two things together. Um, it was a madhouse. It was uh, a disaster. It was, you know, a billion people showed up that day. I, I was very surprised. But we take the kids to Disneyland, and we go into one of the hotels, and we got ice cream for my four-year-old, big old, you know, triple-decker cone. And, of course, the first thing she does is drop the cone as we exit the uh, – the ice cream store. And so, you know, I'm upset because I just spent $18 on ice cream at uh, Disney. And, you know, my wife is starting to look around for some napkins to try to clean it up. And my seven-year-old starts making fun of my four-year-old. And then I get angry at my seven-year-old for making fun of my four-year-old. And my four-year-old, it's like the worst tragedy that has ever occurred to her. I mean, it's just like, you know, she's completely horrified it's, it's it's you know she's inconsolable and and i sort of look up and, and a, a a housekeeper comes walking across and my first thought was the housekeeper was going to clean up the mess great good you know someone to help deal with this mess and instead what happens is when she gets there she she says come with me and she takes us into the ice cream shop and she exchanges a couple of words with the woman behind the counter and a new ice cream cone is produced and handed to my my four-year-old, who stops crying immediately, and I'm happy about that. Um, you know, I, and I go to reach in my pocket for my wallet. No, 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 no charge. Don't worry about it. Um, you know, everyone's suddenly happier. And, and the reason I tell this story, the reason I love this story is it's a great example of a level of service design and a level of empowerment for your frontline workers that illustrates that any one of the people who are in your company are responsible for providing a, a, a better service, a better experience um, for your customers. So even this person, even though this person's a housekeeper, uh, her job was to sort of carry the mantra of Disneyland, which is you know, Disneyland is the happiest place on earth. Right? No one can be unhappy at Disneyland, and therefore uh, her job is to make everyone happy. So she comes over, she takes care of it. Um, and we come outside after having gotten this new ice cream cone, and someone else had cleaned up the mess. So the first response, or the first responder, right, this woman, you know, her job was to make us happy, not to, you know, clean up the mess, which is sort of what I was thinking. Just a great example of, of excellent service and, and, and sort of like well-designed um, frontline workers and how they, they're empowered to do things. And as far as design goes, um, there have been numerous pieces of coverage in both traditional and, and, and sort of uh, other media, um, you know, starting as far back as maybe 10 years ago, but certainly of late, it's, it's been sort of top of mind for a lot of businesses, such that, you know, back in the day when I first started, uh, you know, I, I couldn't find anything necessarily in design. And today, you know, I, 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 can't, uh, I can't pop on Google without getting, you know, a, a huge amount of results. For, and that's just, you know, for simple things like design thinking, 22 million results. And of the 22 million results, you know, not all of them are great, but there's a ton of great content out there, right? And all these companies and all of these sort of um, these media companies are very focused on thinking about how to incorporate design thinking into businesses. And so the question is, is sort of why? And the answer is design um, as a sort of a, a basic set of tools has been around for a long time, okay? And so when you look at sort of the way design is sort of um, described, so here's Charles and Ray Eames, uh, the designers of the, this Eames lounge chair, among others, um, very noted designers in, in, uh, in the 60s and the 50s and uh, in America, and, and they, did, they say that uh, design is, one could describe design as a plan for arranging of elements to accomplish a particular purpose. 
and and sort of with that in mind, the thinking is is that pretty much everything is designed. Not everything is designed very well, but everything is designed. And design, uh, without the design thinking part, just design, um, is is applicable within a lot of different aspects. So there's all sorts of different kinds of design. So um, 2D and 3D product design, so the physical design of product, industrial design, is what my original degree is in, graphic design, you're very familiar with, uh, this experience design, which is something I've been talking about, and service design as well. But design sort of spans a number of these different aspects. So when we think about design, we're probably more thinking about uh, print design, graphic design, um, some visual design, so how a marketing campaign might uh, might roll with a, a set of design. But it, it, it seemed to be very clear that it was necessary to begin to think about modeling how we think about design and how we think about design complexity. And this is a, a model that I borrowed from uh, um, a young PhD student. And it talks about design complexity. And, and at the very lowest level of this model, where um, the complexity is, is on the left-hand scale and it goes from low to high in the pyramid, um, at the lowest level is the artifacts of design. And that might be uh, the specific product, like an iPhone, um, you know, a dress in terms of fashion design, a piece of print media, uh, a website. Right? These are sort of what I describe as the artifacts of design, the objects that are the outcomes of, of some of the basic aspects of design. But as I was saying before, um, you know, everything is designed, but few things are designed well. Okay? Um, and this is a, a quote from Brian Reed. And this, this, um, this individual has, you know, gone out of her way to create a series of objects that are specifically designed poorly um, to sort of, um, you know, to hyperbole of, of bad design, but there's plenty of design out there that's, that's not uh, communicative, not uh, useful or necessary, not, um, um, not well crafted, okay? And so design at the lowest level could be a set of boots, uh, ideally without holes in them so that it doesn't get your socks wet, um, but design at the lowest level is, is that artifact level. But, and moving up, you start to get into design thinking, which is something that we're, we're sort of here to focus on. And as far as design thinking goes, it has uh, got roots back into 1969 with the gentleman Herbert Simon, uh, but it was popularized as a process and a set of techniques uh, by the folks over at IDEO, as a design firm, it's a pretty well-known design firm, a gentleman named Tim Brown, is one of the uh, early partners at, at IDEO. And the application of design thinking helps to, to essentially provide a process and a framework around which you can design. So design isn't something that is necessarily, uh, you know, let's send the, the designers, the graphic designers, the creatives off into a room and they're going to come back with a design. It actually has a series of, of tenets and principles. And so the way that, that we like to refer to it at McKinsey for design is design thing is a user-centered problem-solving approach characterized by solutions that are visualized, working backwards from that conceptual model towards an ideal. And we like to very much balance user needs, right, this user-centered piece of it, with business goals. Um, that design is not art, right? If, if uh, I wanted to be an artist and starve to death, that'd be fine, and I could create beautiful things, but if they're not solving a business problem, uh, then it's, it's, it's art and not design. Design solves business problems. So we'd like to sort of put those two things together. But as far as the sort of the, the meat and potatoes of, of what uh, design thinking is, there are a number of different aspects of design thinking, but I'd like to, to describe sort of these three, okay? Uh, these three tenets. So understanding a customer, the notion of, of lateral thinking and how it breaks pattern thinking, and iteration as it's applied to the creation of things like prototypes uh, and designs to come up with the final solution. Okay, so understand your customer. So we like to go out and as, as the very first part of design thinking and usually what, what we call a discover phase, we like to go out and we like to meet with customers. Okay. There might be, uh, your company might have a set of demographics that suggests in general who your groups of customers might be. We use that as a tool to begin to um, recruit and we'll send a, a set of folks out to find those specific people within that demographic. 
So the demographics, um, while uh, you know useful and and uh, you know in consideration of of how you might want to sell things uh, as a group, absolutely. But we like to go talk to specific people. We like to go and ideally interview them in the context of how they're using your product or service. So it could be while they're at work. It could be um, in their homes. Uh, we call it a you know contextual inquiry. It's sort of a fancy way of saying you know we interview people where where they are, like you know what, where it sort of it seems reasonable to to find out more about who they are and what they're doing because we're looking to understand their behaviors. We're looking to understand who they are, what they do, how they do their jobs, how they you know engage with your product, um, and we're looking for what they say, and we're also looking for what they do. But we're also looking for sort of things they don't say and that they they uh, they do but but you know don't say. So you know we might uh, be doing some research with users. Uh, and one of my favorite examples is we you know we go to this folk this person's house. We're doing some research on uh, how they like to cook. And in in sort of a, a preliminary interview, just sitting around the kitchen table, you know we're asking them questions like so what are the kinds of things you like to eat. And, you know, they're saying things like, well, I eat very healthy, you know, kale and quinoa and, you know, only salads and, you know, things like this. And so that's fine and good um, because they want to project this, this sort of vision of themselves. We go into their kitchen and start to do a walk through the kitchen and we open the cabinet and the cupboard and what we find is, you know, Cheetos and Oreos. And, and this is not to say that this person is lying. This, this is just to say that this person um, has a projection of themselves. They sort of think of themselves in one way but actually are themselves in a sort of a different way. And that understanding, um, that contextual inquiry, going, going to their homes, you only find those sorts of things out um, by visiting and by getting inside their heads. And we do this um, entirely to gain a level of empathy uh, for who these people are, to get to know these people on a deeper level than just understanding the basic demographics. So to know that you know, this person that we're looking at is you know, it's not a, you know, an 85-year-old person in a, in a particular region. You know, this is uh, Sarita, uh, and she's lovely, and she's got her own um, uh, things that she's trying to get done, uh, you know, with your product or with your service. And as we begin to understand who the customers are, we then begin to craft out um, their journeys, okay? So a customer journey is a, a typical uh, artifact or output of, of uh, getting to know and understand who your customers are, getting to sort of um, get information from your, your folks. And we do this because we want to understand. What you're looking at actually is a, um, a sort of a more finalized representation. But what we're looking at here on the lowest level there is um, the existing journey of this person, Julia, after we talk to a number of people who are like Julia. And the orange line above is, is sort of a more um, conceptual representation in order to solve her pain point. So if you zoom in, you can see that there's a series of, of X's and red, uh, red circles, and those represent pain points. So during the interview process, we'll, we will have determined that someone like Julia had you know, particular pain points at particular parts of uh, her process or her journey as it relates to your product and service. In this case, it's um, Julia trying to find a, a lending product and, and what were her pain points for that. And then what we do is we begin to craft um, a more finalized or a conceptual representation, as I was saying, as, as far as the, um, uh, the description of, of design thinking goes, we, we craft a sort of a conceptual representation of who we who we think Julie is as it relates to how we solve her pain points and what ideas and concepts might um, best represent and best solve her pain points. So if you're looking at a journey on the bottom, that is, let's say, a current state journey, and the, and the journey above illustrates how we can improve and change these sort of low points, these, these pain points in her journey. And this is a, a, a tool that begins to express who Julia is and what Julia's like, okay? So our second tenet uh, of design thinking that, that we like to highlight is this notion of lateral thinking, uh, breaking pattern thinking, okay? There's a gentleman, Edward de Bono, came up with a, a set of concepts as far as what he described as, as lateral thinking. And in order to understand lateral thinking, you think about sort of 
pattern thinking. Every one of us, every single day, engages in pattern thinking. We all put our pants on the same way. Uh, we all brush our teeth the same way. And we do this because it, it's unnecessary for us to innovate as far as um, how we brush our teeth or how we put on our clothes. Um, we don't have to do it in a funky and strange and different way just because um, it's, it's a completely unnecessary task. So pattern thinking is a particularly useful way for humans to behave on a regular basis. You get in your car, you drive it the same way, um, you drive to work the same way, uh, you do these, these things, you know, in, in terms of, of driving the curve for safety reasons. But the fact is, is that pattern thinking helps us to sort of get through our days. Where pattern thinking isn't as useful is when we want to talk about innovation. And so um, when we get to the point within our organizations where we need to do things differently in order to increase efficiencies or, um, you know, um, increase ROI or come up with a new product that our customers are going to love. We will have talked to our customers, but then we could implement a series of tools that are lateral thinking exercise that help us to get to those concepts that I was talking about within that journey, get us to a point where we could sit as a group together and we can understand how we might um, break the pattern thinking in order to sort of jump to the left and think in just a new way in order to be able to come up with a new concept. And the last tenant that I'll talk about, again, although there are numerous tenants within, um, is this notion of iteration. So the concepts that we came up with, as I illustrated them in the, in the journey I was just showing, um, might be something that we come up with initially and that we you know, put them down on paper and we uh, discuss them as a team and we think about them, uh, are not the final concepts, right? They're not the, the end result. Um, that the, the end result is something that's gonna have to be iterated upon um, a great deal in order to come to the, the right sort of solution. Um, you know, Velcro came out as a, uh, an invention in the 50s. But it wasn't until you know, 40 years later when it started to be applied to shoes that it became something a lot more ubiquitous and a lot, a lot more sort of used. It took an amount of time uh, and iteration for the, for the notion of Velcro, for the invention of Velcro to be widely implemented. And so in this diagram, we show uh, that there's a problem and that we you know, work around that problem and, and sort of iterate within that problem set. And that even when we get to something that we see as a solution, we still iterate as we develop that solution in order to be able to come to the most perfect example within a, a schedule and, and a time frame. And all of this sits in the model of design complexity in this middle section. So from going out and talking with users, we all want to understand their behaviors. We want to understand what the experience of, of how they, they, they do their day. Um, is, right, we want to understand all of that in order to be able to think about how we might provide the product or, or service that we're developing in the context of how they do their work or they, they get their jobs done or they, um, you know, use your product or service in their homes, however it happens to be, okay? So we think of these things as, um, as part of this middle level of complexity. And they're a little bit more nebulous, right? That diagram that I was just showing, the sort of the journey that I was just showing is an example of a, a deliverable out of this phase, um, but it's not something that you can necessarily use. It's simply a communicative tool to illustrate um, who Julia is, what her pain points are, and you know, what sorts of concepts you might come up with to solve for particular pain points. And so all of that exists in this sort of middle section. There are a lot of companies out there who are starting to think of um, and implement design within their organizations at a, at a very systemic and, and sort of organizational level. They're thinking about um, you know, policy and regulation and how they might um, deal with those things. So for instance, uh, Uber uh, knew that they were gonna run into issues as far as implementing the service in certain cities and they might run into and, and had begun to run into in a number of cases, um, you know, sort of the taxi, the existing taxi industry. Uh, they went out and hired David Plouffe, his former campaign manager for Obama. And they said, look, you know, we need you to start to think about um, how we might lobby 
to change laws in order to make our uh, service available in different places. And in some places they haven't won, right? So they just got kicked out of Austin, uh, pretty famously, them and Lyft. Um, but in, in many other places, they're uh, fighting fairly substantially and, and sort of implementing um, a policy and policy design and recrafting the policies of the places they go in order to implement their service. So certain companies that think at the very highest level, um, a systemic level of complexity, and I, we like to refer to this as sort of being design conscious or design consciousness. And some of those companies might be companies that you've heard of, uh, companies like IBM, Apple, I mentioned Uber, uh, Kaiser Permanente is a, a great example of a very um, holistic um, and, and, and vertically integrated healthcare provider in California and other places. Uh, Tesla, GE, uh, these are companies that think about design at, at sort of the deepest level or the, or the highest level of complexity is the case of the model thinking. So when you talk about um, individual instances of these companies, right, Tesla is a, one of my favorite examples because Tesla thinks about um, systemically how they're going to implement, um, you know, um, their services and their, and their product and their product suite. But it's not just about the car. It's not just about an electric car. It's about um, how, they might have, how they might have power storage in terms of the power wall which is fed from solar panels, which, you know, is their relationship with Solar City. They just sort of made that a little bit more substantive and bought them. Uh, and then they just came out, literally like two, three days ago, they just did a presentation. Elon Musk got up and, and presented uh, solar panels that were integrated into the roof tiles of your roofs. And he's increased the service of his implementation with Solar City to include, uh, you know, building a, we'll build you a whole new roof. So that includes those tiles that he's now selling. So he's thinking, Tesla's thinking about um, the incorporation of design, design thinking, his systemic approach to how he implements design. And another one of my favorite examples is that, you know, they're, they're sort of light years ahead as far as their cars go um, from the rest of the auto industry in as much as they're thinking about the software integration with their cars, such that for Tesla, they recently put out um, – they started putting out all of the hardware necessary for their cars to be entirely self-driving and that when uh, everything else catches up, when the rest of the sort of the, uh, the system catches up with, with our ability to have self-driving cars, they'll just do a push. They'll just do an upgrade. And it'll say, you want to you know, upgrade to the latest Tesla? And you'll say, sure. And you press a button without having to go out and buy a new self-driving car, your Tesla will be a self-driving car. And so they're, they're thinking about it from that perspective and that sort of, um, um, very close to my heart in terms of, of how software is delivered. But getting back to Disney as an example, that's another sort of example of a company that thinks systemically. So we didn't have a chance to experience this when we went to Disneyland because they've only implemented it at Disney World. But at Disney World, if you're going to go, you can get these magic bands. And the magic bands are something that you can order ahead of time and that show up ahead of time. They can be different colors. And what they do is they allow you to pop the band in your wrist and they reduce numerous friction points within the park to make the experience easier for you. So no longer, if you've got the magic band, do you need a key to your Disney hotel room because your band is the key to the hotel room. No longer do you need to um, have tickets for parking because your band is your, is your essentially ticket for parking. No longer do you need to carry around the little plastic cards that they give you when they take photographs of your daughters with princesses, as mine, as mine did when we went to Disneyland. You can have the band and just swipe it at these touch points, sort of the Mickey Mouse uh, touch point. And that that is, is a very systemic approach to how design is incorporated throughout the Disney park in a way that, um, that reduces friction, um, that makes the experience better, that is, you know, uh, just a big part of how uh, Disney is thinking about um, the way in which they do business. And of course, one of my favorite examples is Apple. Um, and not because Apple, you know, makes pretty good products, as they do, right? And it's sort of very hard to argue with their, uh, their market cap and, their, and the amount of money they've got in the bank. But one of the things about Apple is, and, and this is true of, of uh, when Steve Jobs was there, we, I was at a company that was a startup that was making uh, capacitive touchscreen 
uh, devices, right, little tablets. We were among the first to come out with a device that was a, a cap touch device. And we began to build this device for a customer of ours, and then the iPad came out. And it was sort of soul crushing because they put a big billboard up right across from our office, so it just stared at us in the face. We went out and got an iPad and we opened it up, and my mechanical engineers at the time uh, took a look inside, and one of the things they noticed is that they had Apple had colored the flat ribbon cabling to their specification, which is not something that is normally done in a, in a piece of electronic device, just not done. So Apple had sort of taken the time to think about, we want this thing to have this color and this look such that when you uh, opened it up, if you were going to open it up, um, that the insides sort of match the outsides in terms of design. And very few companies think that way, right? So. If I get back to my uh, model of complexity and where these companies sort of reside on this uh, on this uh, this model, that Disney, Apple, Tesla um, think about design from sort of an organizational perspective. It's incorporated into how they do business, so they are very much um, design conscious. Right? They, they are thinking in a design and conscious fashion. Um, Apple, sorry, uh, GE and IBM are working diligently to try to hire designers and to rethink the way they have been operating over the past and however long they've been operating number of them for a number of years. Um, um, but GE woke up at a certain point and, and noticed that they were a very large software developer, right? something like the 14th in the world. And they said, well, how can we incorporate, even though we make jet engines, how can we incorporate this into the way in which we do business? How can we incorporate software and design? Well, IBM is the same way. Um, HP, on the other hand, is still sort of stuck at a sort of a departmental level. They've got designers. They've got design teams working on products, uh, but they don't think systemically across their product line such that, you know, if you, if you went out to buy a printer, uh, you might find that there's something like 55 or 60 different um, SKUs of printers out there. Which one do you want? And the answer is it's very difficult to determine. Some of the SKUs are divided by uh, costs as little as $5. Uh, you know, and maybe a couple of feature line items on the side of the box. It's very difficult to understand how they, they do business. And if you phone United, I'm simply not a big fan. I hope there's no United folks on the on the call, but if you phone United, I'm simply not a big fan. They don't take a very systemic approach or a very user-centered approach to how they uh, implement their services and their product, which is, you know, flights. So, you know, I get much better service on Delta. I get much better service in, you know, Virgin. Um, if you've ever flown Virgin America, my wife uh, uh, had the notion that, you know, I said, well, what do you think? It was the first time flying Virgin. She said, oh, it's like flying in an iPod. So, like, her perspective on that was that they, they thought about it, right? They thought about sort of the ambiance inside. And United is just still not there. They're still, they're a very large carrier. They don't, they don't, uh, uh, they have incorporated design thinking in a sort of a meaningful way. And I'm, I've got 7-Eleven on there as well. Is that they have designers, they do design work. Uh, but they think about it at a very product level without thinking holistically about how they might apply design thinking to the entirety of their stores uh, in a way that would be meaningful. So you end up with design that's a little bit divided. And that's the presentation that I've got on, on design thinking. We're going to get into the QA in just a moment, uh, but thank you very much for your time, um, and we're going to be answering questions in, in a bit. Um, and if you have any questions, you are also welcome to email me at the email address listed on this slide. And uh, I'm part of Digital McKinsey, which is our, was our last slide. And thank you. Hey, Dave, that was absolutely brilliant. And it, it formed such a great groundwork for anybody who wasn't quite sure how it was going to apply to their business or whether there was relevancy for their business, I think you've, you've built the exact perfect infrastructure for people to take on the concept and run with it if they weren't familiar with it. As Dave mentioned, uh, if you have questions, uh, please put them into the Q&A tab. Uh, we'll be entertaining questions at the end uh, once uh, our second speaker is finished, and we'll try and get to as many of those as we possibly can. In order to make sure that we have some time for questions, I'm going to move immediately to our next speaker, who is David Fenske. Uh, he is the president of Fenske Media, and uh, he is our use case example. The, the team at Fenske Media have, have taken on the, the design thinking concepts, and they're running with them, and, 
And David, could you please explain to us how that's all working for you? Well, I'll try my best. Thank you for the intro. Uh, good afternoon. My name is David Fenske, uh, Fenske Media, Rapid City, South Dakota. And it's my purpose here in these few, next few slides is to put some connective tissue behind Dave's uh, thought process and design thinking. And what we're using it for is how we connect it to our core product of print and what that's meant to the customer moving forward. So in, in our experience, that it's always been about the customer and always will be. And so for us at Fenske Media, design thinking creates focused methods to really improve our Fenske business model overall. And while we have been printers since 1957, and print is an extremely valuable and large part of our current business, the discipline of, of design thinking really allows Fenske Media to provide greater value to our customers not just the production of quality, innovative print products. And as you see, the sample of the, the Wired magazine cover on the left there, that's from the October issue, last, last month's issue. And as you page through it, there's several examples of case studies from retail, um, cosmetics, healthcare, and finance that really talk about innovators as, as they take this theory of design thinking and, in, and involve the customer experience into it. And hopefully at the end of it, it, it's like Thomas Watson, the, the modern founder of IBM says, is that nothing happens in business until something gets sold. And so uh, once again, it's always about the customer and the opportunity to go ahead and improve that business as we, as we work together. But really, we're, we're involved as, as we connect print into this design thinking into the customer experience, we're looking at six attributes that we seek to have in place as we dialogue in the journey, as Dave talked about that persona of Susan or Julia with her two young daughters and as she was trying to look for medical payments and the pain and joy of, of trying to work through that problem, it's the customer journey that we're really involved with right now with the digital customer. In, in, you, in essence, it's more than just digital marketing. It's much more. It's, it's marketing execution to digital customers. And so what we're talking about here is in that customer journey, I have four words of thinking, weights, and feeling acts. And this really relates to the brain science studies that have been done um, by Hewlett Packard and other thought leaders that the limbic portion of our brain really sets the stage for how we're going to go ahead and be an interactive component of, of deciding what to buy. And through that limbic portion or the connecting of the emotional side of the human being, the, the portion of the brain that makes the decision to move forward, we really try to go ahead and shape this customer journey or this customer experience into a, a three-prong approach of conquering why I should consider that this is a smart proposition or a value proposition to do, what it is that I'm, and the facts about the product or service that I need to consider and understand, and then how can I transact and, and create um, this on my own terms to make it my experience happy and, and to do this on my own terms. And so that, that condenses down to thinking weights and feeling acts. And to deliver that, then, we, we really put, try to put six attributes or six functions within each experience or each journey that we're focused on. We have personalized, customized, which really talks about the use of data. Um, as coming from a print background and the use of variable data print in the mailbox, it's, it's the understanding of data and, the, and adaptive data using transactional or customer-based data of who bought what and how much they bought and when they bought, and trying to use the, those connection points of, of what the appropriate service transaction that, that we could suggest in the future. Number two is two-way communications and, and using responsiveness. It's the ability not just to go ahead and have a one-sided story of this is the right thing for you. It's allowing the consumer to have the power now to choose what they have in mind. And so it's that two-way communication, allowing them through a decision tree or some gamification response to go ahead and, and app. In the old days, we used to have business reply cards that would go ahead and suggest that th this is my response. But in today's world, it's the opportunity to go online, to make a phone call, to talk to somebody in social media. It's that a way to respond in different ways that we can go ahead and open the dialogue, two-way communication. Three is that connected data-driven issue, making each step along the way personalized. Personalized print has been with us for many, many years. 
personalized interactive web sessions are a brand new function, and that's something that we're focusing on in the cross-media world as we try to take those same concepts and, and move them back into it. Four is actionable and, and, and transactional. Give the opportunity to the customer that once I've worked through the correct emotional connection, why this should be appropriate for me to consider this product or service, and what it is, then give them the opportunity to go ahead and act. Don't require them to call somebody. Don't require them to send something in. Allow the consumer to have the power to make a decision to do something at that moment. Five is the insightful trackable. It, the, the benefits of living in the digital world really give us the opportunity now to go ahead and have insight into that consumer household through big data. But that big data sometimes can be one-sided as marketers as we push that data and or model it into something that we want to go ahead and, and have them react to. It's the trackable opportunity. Understand where they're, they're missing the point. What pain points are we causing them through this new product or experience or, or opportunity or channel that we can go ahead and, and measure those pain points and, and improve upon them. So tracking them from state to step is if they get a mail, if, is a, it, are they going to react to going online? If so, we should measure where they go online. If they go online, do they click to start a video or start a function? Where do they, do they follow through the experience or do we disrail at, at the same time? Do we follow all the way through that it's time to go ahead and click to buy or click to transact? Where's the, where's the pain points in that whole experience of that journey that we can go ahead and relate to and improve? And then six is the behavioral or multi-channel experience out of it. The multi-channel experience is, follows back to it's always about the customer. And that was rule number one, and when in doubt, refer to rule number one. Multi-channel for us then means allowing the customer to have the power to go ahead and drive the experience accordingly but put the point in place through design thinking to go ahead and allow for that customer to go ahead and do it on their terms. If I look at a real world example of how I've done, been able to connect our business model of variable data print that we've done for almost 25 years here, and what we can do in connecting that into a, a, a digital side, this is a flow chart of what product we use that we created for our proprietary platform called VIP, or Variable Interactive Pearl. So I'm going to take those six actionable or, or, or enhanced steps that we just went through and put this in place now. And if you look at the top right-hand corner, there's an illustration of a printed postcard for in, in this example that I'm trying to demonstrate. And so what we're trying to do is work with a real rough segmentation in the customer base to begin with. As in this case, I have an illustration of a, a offer for an insurance product on a um, motor home or a trailer product. So I'm start segmenting you if you have motorized vehicles or non-motorized vehicles. And what I'm doing is yeah, that postcard then has a pearl on it. And so uh, what we're able to do is drive that pearl or through a password, like most of you have done at, with, in testing pearls and in print. As, but the hitch is, is that when I drive you to the website, I've already taken the same things that we've done for print and connected into video now. So in this case, it's, it's easiest to think of variable data printing, you know, the one-to-one -one print communications using rich data. That VDP in variable data print is to print. It's compared to print as IVX just compares to video. An IVX product that we have in our platform is called Interactive Video Experience. And what we're doing is connecting video to real-time data experiences. And so we're able at the same time using I as the interactive is where, back to those six points again, we deliver a two-way relevant message to each consumer based upon the connected transactional data that we have available that can pre-populate the video experience so it's a personalized video and it's acting as a personalized video mailer in, in, in essence. The V is the video component. Video, video delivers emotion, and emotion is how we're going to drive the decision-making process. We allow video to connect with that feeling part of the human brain I mentioned and allows that consumer to better understand the value proposition being presented at that moment. And that the sum them up, the interaction combined with the video, out of it we get experience. And the experience at the end of an IVX session, the consumer experience is understood as a relevant, personal, and actionable message that's carefully crafted to educate and motivate a buying decision. 
So we're, mo we're, we're moving it into behavioral influence to go ahead and allow that consumer to act to it. That's the center component. So through that interaction, tell me how many miles you travel in your motor home. Tell me how, how old it is. Tell me what um, places you like to travel and, and experience in camping. How do you use it? Who travels with you? That volunteer of that two-way responses then creates additional data that we can acknowledge through back through personalized email. So you can see I can either send you back a customized print that reacts to the message. Oh, I see you drive 15,000 miles a year and your motorhome is four years old, so you qualify for a certain rate or an offer of, of, a, of a service offering. Or else I can go ahead and drive back to your desktop or your mobile device or your handheld device and go ahead and salute you with an e-personalized email driving you back to a free quote or some other way that we can go ahead and close the loop on all these business activities as you try to go ahead and surface the decisions of what to buy and why it's a correct fit for me. And at the bottom then, you, you see all the channels that we've opened up for the consumer to react. All their opportunities and based upon the emotion I've driven you to go ahead and make an intelligent decision, now offer you the multiple opportunities to respond via email, open up a chat box to go ahead and, and clarify a detail, make a direct call to, if I want to go ahead and, and have a lengthy discussion, click to learn more, um, download information brochures that might be protecting to me as a trailer owner versus a motorhome owner, make an appointment if I need to go ahead and have a salesperson engage in the experience or if I want to go ahead and have a service call or something. Look at social share. What, what are my friends doing? I hate, how is the friend buddy I met at the campground that owns the same machine? Is, what's he doing about his insurance model? At the same time, make a transaction. I get it. You've taught me all I need to know, and I'm ready to buy. How do I do it? So connect to, connect to buy at the same time. Lastly, I think that measuring the ROI is, is everybody's concern. Is, is all this effort makes sense or not? And all I can say is that in our Fenske XM cross-media solutions, it, it dramatically improves our customer ROI. And there's four separate ways of looking at lead conversion. Um, click-through rates, prospects and, and, and how they measure and, and how they voice their decision, what channels they prefer to use, as well as the important one of how can I engage with the customer over a longer period of time using these types of, of, of attributes of, through design thinking and how is that going to improve my customer experience. I hope that's been helpful. Thank you. Dave, that was absolutely brilliant. That uh, it, it's so great to have a, a practical view of how you've applied these design thinking ideas and techniques into actually building your business out and creating happy customers. So we said that we would uh, give you a chance for questions. So if you have a burning question, please drop it into the Q&A box. While you're doing that, let me sum up what you've heard. Now you know why design thinking is on everybody's lips. It's there to improve the customer experience and to increase their loyalty. So a little bit of effort on your part to actually look at your business from a design perspective can drive better business your way. Now you know how. You know to break out of your old patterns and then lather, rinse, and repeat until you find a model that works for you your organizations, and the customers you serve. And you know the opportunity. The opportunity is to develop more and deeper engagements with your customers so that they become those customers for life that everyone wants. So we're up for the question and answer session. And, and thanks for those of you who sent some uh, questions in ahead of time, and for those of you who are populating our question box right now. The first question uh, is actually one that is sort of an interesting one. It's why is it important for customers or clients to share their key performance indicators with, with somebody who's trying to help them? So <laughs> I think that actually both Dave and David might have some perspective on this. Um, Dave, do you do you want to jump in on on why it's important for the customer to share what they're trying to do? Yeah, I mean, you know, if 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 the business problem is illustrated to to me as a consultant, um, myself and my team can 
have a better um, um, handle on how to solve the problem and how to address uh, that with, with you as a customer and your clients who are ultimately the customers. So the more information we have, the better off we are. Right? It's, you know, and more information is always better. And, and so, David Sinsky, do your customers push back on you around sharing the, their actual goals, or, or do they really see you as that partner that's going to help them grow as well? Well, I, I, eventually there's there's some some pushback, but I think when, once we work it through, it, it, with regards to KPIs, though, I think that's a, a, probably the greatest starting point to break down those barriers because it it creates three opportunities for us. Number one, it it shifts us from being a vendor into a partner relationship, which is very important. And once you become a partner, um, the inflow of information becomes um, easier on both sides. Um, secondly, I think it gives us a, a shared vision of goal of why we're working together in the first place. And, and, and the, through those shared visions, then, it gives us certain goals that we can go ahead and know that we're reaching for towards success or, or parts of the process that need to be rejiggered in, the, in a digital workflow. And then lastly, I think it, it gives us measurable ROI and, and improvements um, stages that we, we know we're reaching for together. And, and so I think that the shared KPI set is, is makes all the sense in the world to start it. So a question that came in ahead of the webinar was the, if you had any financial metrics that supported the concept that integration of design thinking into the organizational culture is beneficial to the business. Um, do either of you have actual metrics that you can share? And, and Dave, you, you had mentioned to us earlier, Dave Hoffer, you had mentioned to us earlier that you were aware of one set but I, I didn't know if there were if there was more that you can share. And David Finsky, if you'd encountered any along the way helping customers. So the the I think that the the thing to note is is that um, your metrics for success and how incorporating um, you know customer feedback and sort of iterative approaches and and these things are are um, are going to be relatively unique to your organization. Uh, you have your own processes. Your processes are unique. Um, your incentives for your employees are unique. KPIs are unique to, to you. Um, so it, it behooves us to sort of begin to think about implementing some of these design thinking techniques or as, as all of the design thinking techniques in order to get a better handle on what your customers actually need in order to be able to deliver better products and services for your customers. And in that way, you'd be able to think about, well, how we were doing it before and what were, those, uh, what were the, the KPIs that we had before and, and what new, new metrics might we develop uh, based on rethinking the way we're going to be delivering this, this, uh, this product or this service. So um, there are uh, some tools out there that have begun to examine how companies who are a bit more design driven are uh, you know performing better uh, than others who might be a little less design driven so there's the design management institute you can go to their website now and take a look at their uh, uh, design index where they've uh, captured a number of companies where they have looked at them and thought of them as a, a more design driven company many of them uh, are companies that i just was talking about and track those against the, the average Dow, or just a, a, a general set in the Dow. Uh, and they, they seem to perform better, right? Um, the, the, the stats that they came up with suggest that they're uh, doing better by something along the lines of 250% against their competitors. Now, each of those companies has their own um, metrics by, by which they're sort of tracking how they're doing. And some of it might be, um, you know, at the very basic level, they make some a piece of software more usable. They have less support calls. It's a very simple metric. Um, or they have higher sales based on the implementation of a new feature that was considered a, a solution or pain point from you know working with a customer. So at the very basic level, there are those kinds of metrics, and, and it's really just unique to each organization how they they behave. I think. And and David Finsky, how did you? track the, the value proposition around 
integrating design thinking into Sensky Media? Well, it was um, twofold. Number one was the desire to increase our print business uh, using the, the technology now that, that's out there through the, the Kodak Prosper systems uh, that we could do high volume runs with higher quality and at lower unit costs than previously known, and the ability at the same time to go ahead and um, increase our, the length of engagement with our customers so that we could go ahead and get a, an increased share of their business. Okay. So um, the next question is sort of along those same lines. How do you see a retailer like 7-Eleven, Dave Hoffer, you mentioned them, building a synergy around design thinking when they don't necessarily have control over all of the things that need to happen within the store. They don't have control over the way the packaging looks or the way it's delivered or how their suppliers want to work with them. For, for a company like that, how would they tend to, to uh, apply a design thinking model that would raise them up in your pyramid? You know, I, I think it's, it's about taking a more holistic approach. And I think that they, if they thought about it, um, if they were to um, um, do some deep research with their customers and with their employees, their frontline employees within the stores, and if they were to sort of take a look at, at the way in which they do business, they would probably find that they have a great deal more control than, they, than you might suggest. Right? They might uh, suggest, that, I mean, not all of the products that they sell certainly are theirs, but they do have their own products. And how those are, are consistently represented, um, how the in-store displays are, are uh, crafted, how digital is incorporated into the way in which they do business, how um, information is tracked about purchase of, of product within stores and across stores, um, I think there's a great deal that they can do. And, um, you know, it's up to them. It's up to them to go do that. Um, and it's, a, it's a, a change from the way they've done business in the past. If in the past the way they've does, done business is we're going to set up a store, we're going to have one on, on every corner or, you know, a lot of corners, and we're going to sell products and they're going to be cheap and we're going to have as much, you know, as, as customers might need. Uh, that's all well and good. And that's sort of served them to date. They've been a successful company to date because of that. Um, but moving into a more modern, uh, um, you know, into the 21st century, they've got to really begin to think about uh, how can they incorporate uh, design thinking, digital, agile methodologies into the ways in which they do business in order to increase efficiencies, in order to uh, maximize their, their ROI on, on product sales, things like this. So I think they can take a, a, a longer look at it. They can take a better and closer and deeper look at it um, and find that the, the, they would do better based on that. And it doesn't have to happen all at so once. In, uh, it's, a big, it's a big thing to do, but go ahead. So in go the ahead. end, they, if they would go to a Disney school and give you the same experience in your local 7-Eleven that you had at the ice cream store at Disneyland, that, that would go a long way towards making more loyal customers. But possibly, um, certainly. I would, I would hope that that would be the case. And I think that's the case. I mean, you know, if you go to a, a if you've ever been to a, um, there's a, a fast food joint in, in, on the West Coast called In-N-Out Burger. It's very popular. And it was the first instance of, of um, uh, that I'd seen where they send, when the line is long at the drive through they send a worker out to get orders ahead of, of the kiosk. You know, so that, that worker will come out and they'll, they'll pop into the line of cars and they'll start taking orders through a, uh, like a tablet-like device. That's the first instance I've seen. Burger King doesn't do that. McDonald's doesn't do that as far as I know. They're, they're willing to take a step further in terms of providing a better level of service. Um, and I think that that, that is applicable to 7-Eleven. Um, now, does that mean that they've got uh, someone who's going to come out into the parking lot and get your order before you even come into the store? Probably not. Um, but there are other things that they can do, certainly, and, and it behooves them to try at least, right? Begin to think about trying and, and, and try to implement and try to improve the way in which they do business. So there were quite a few really excellent questions that are hanging out here, but we are right at the top of the hour and we need to uh, end our time together. 
We want to thank everyone for spending an hour with us. We hope that it was really valuable, uh, that you got exactly what you needed out of it, that you're going to start thinking a little bit differently how you work with in your organization and how your organizations work with your customers. I want to thank you on behalf of Printing Impressions, Target Marketing Magazine, and of course Kodak, our, our sponsor for today. Uh, be sure to check out the webinar page to get all the information on all of the archived and upcoming webinars. And if you would take just a minute to fill out that brief feedback survey that appears on your screen when we shut the webinar down, we would be incredibly grateful. It helps us immeasurably. We hope we'll see you on the next webinar. And with that, I want to thank Dave Hofford from Digital McKinsey, uh, David Finsky from Finsky Media, our friends at Kodak, and, and I'm Pat McGrew on behalf of InfoTrends. We hope you have a fabulous day.